Chapter 13 In the Minister's Office With my increasing improvement, I felt the need for activity and work. After so long a time and after difficult years of struggle, I was again interested in the round of chores that normally fill up the regular workday of an ordinary person. I couldn't deny that I had missed out on many excellent opportunities while on earth, and that many wrongs had dotted my path. Now, however, I recalled my fifteen years of medical practice, and experienced a kind of emptiness in my heart. I likened myself to an industrious farmer standing in the middle of a field with his hands tied, making it impossible to work. Although I was surrounded by patients, I was not allowed to approach them like before as their friend, doctor, and researcher. I heard incessant moaning from neighboring rooms, but I couldn't lend a hand, not even as a nurse or as a helper in first aid cases. I obviously didn't lack the desire, but my position was yet too humble for me to be too bold." Spirit doctors employed different techniques. Back on earth, I knew that my right to intervene was rooted in the study of official texts and in degrees I had earned. However, in this new environment, medicine began in the heart and was expressed in fraternal care and love. Any nurse, even the humblest in Nasolar, possessed understanding and power that were far superior to my knowledge. Therefore, any attempt at voluntary work on my part was unjustifiable, for I would be invading someone else's cornfield. In light of such difficulties, Lysias was the ideal friend for my brotherly confidences. When I broached the subject, he responded, Why don't you ask for Clarencio's help? He will surely give it. Ask him for advice. He always asks about you and is sure to do his best on your behalf. I was excited and my hopes were high. I would ask the advice of the Minister of Assistance. When I tried to set up an appointment, however, I was told that my kind benefactor would only be able to see me in his private office the next morning. I waited anxiously for the appointed time. Very early in the morning on the following day, I went to Clarencio's office. How great was my surprise when I found three other people in the same situation already waiting for him. The kindly minister of assistance had arrived long before us and was attending to matters much more important than talking to visitors and partitioners. After finishing his most urgent work, he began calling us in pairs. I was puzzled by this procedure of holding a hearing. Later, I found out that he used it so that the solution of a case might profit not only the interested person, but the other as well thereby attending to general needs and saving precious time. After several minutes, it was my turn. I entered the office in the company of an elderly lady who was to be heard first by order of precedence. The minister welcomed us cordially, putting us at ease in order to present our requests. Noble Clarencio, began my unknown companion, I have come to beg your kind services on behalf of my two children. Oh, I can't bear missing them so much. I've been told that both of them are exhausted and overburdened with misfortunes down on earth. I realize that our father's designs are loving and just, but I'm a mother. I can't stop feeling these pangs of anguish. The poor creature broke down in front of us and wept uncontrollably. The minister looked at her sympathetically, but kept his personal firmness intact and answered gently. But sister, if you realize that our father's designs are loving and just, what can I do? I would like to be granted the means of watching over my children myself in the physical sphere, replied the afflicted mother. I'm sorry, my friend, said the loving benefactor, but only in the spirit of humility and service are we able to watch over someone. What would you say about an earthly father who wanted to provide for his children, but then remained idle in the comfort of his home? The father has created labor and cooperation 
has laws that no one may break without causing damage to himself. What does your conscience have to say on the matter? How many hour bonuses can you present for your request? The woman answered hesitantly, 304. It's a pity, continued Clarencio, smiling, that you have lived here for over six years, but have given the colony only 304 hours of work. However, as soon as you recovered from the struggles you had suffered in the lower regions, I offered you a praiseworthy job on the vigilance team of the Ministry of Communication. But that was intolerable work, she interrupted, a constant struggle with malevolent entities. Of course, I couldn't adapt to it. Florencio continued unperturbed. After that, I placed you with the Brothers of Support to perform regenerative duties. That was even worse, exclaimed the woman. Those rooms were always crowded with filthy persons, swearing, indecencies, misery. Seeing that you were having problems there, explained the minister, I sent you to help in the ward for the mentally disturbed. But can anybody but saints tolerate them, inquired the rebellious petitioner. I did my best, but that bunch of deranged souls would frighten anybody. My efforts did not stop there, our patient benefactor continued. I then placed you in the Investigation and Research Department at the Ministry of Elucidation. But by then, I guess you were tired of my arrangements and deliberately retired to the fields of repose. I couldn't even stay there, said the impertinent woman. I only met with exhausting experiments, strange fluids, and harsh supervisors. Remember, my friend, explained the devoted and unshakable instructor, Work and humility are the two sides of the path of assistance. In order to help someone, we need brothers and sisters who become our co-workers, friends, protectors, and servants. Before being able to assist those we love, it is essential that we establish currents of affinity. Without their cooperation, it is impossible to lend them effective aid. The farmer who tills the soil earns the gratitude of those who enjoy the harvest. The worker who satisfies demanding bosses and carries out their orders in the place where the Lord has placed him provides sustenance for his home. The worker who constructively obeys his supervisors wins their good will and the good will of his companions and all those interested in his service and no intermediate administrator can ever be useful to his loved ones if he doesn't know how to obey and serve worthily. No matter the pain in the heart or the difficulty, everyone needs to know that all useful service belongs to the universal giver above all. After a short pause, he resumed, What then could you do on earth if you haven't yet learned how to put up with anything here? I do not doubt your devotion to your dear children, but it's important to realize that you would arrive there like a paralyzed mother, incapable of rendering any effective help at all. To deserve the joy of helping our loved ones, we must enlist the intercession of the persons whom we ourselves have helped. Those who do not cooperate cannot receive cooperation. That is the eternal law. And since you have accumulated nothing of your own to give, you can only turn to the charity of others. But how will you obtain any cooperation from them when you haven't yet sown anything of your own? Not even mere sympathy. So go back to the fields of repose and think about it. We'll examine the matter at a later time and give it our full attention. The disquieted mother sat down and dried her tears. Then the minister looked at me more cheerfully and said, What can I do for you, my friend? I rose hesitantly to talk to him.